Good evening. Appreciate very much the opportunity to be able to stand before you this evening. Appreciate the elders giving me this opportunity. The text for the lesson this evening is from 2 Peter 1, and verse 4. And I appreciate Brother Thomas reading that for us. And it says there in the first part of that verse, by which he is granted to us his precious and very great promises. I think when you read that, that's such powerful language there. That's such a beautiful verse, such beautiful language that's being used. Precious promises. When we think of something precious, we think of something that is of very great value, something that's very costly. However, when we think of promises, we, we don't usually think of promises in that manner. And we don't think of that because it seems like the promises, the promises that are made today by man seem to fail. I'm sure when I was growing up, if I promised Dad that I would go out and mow the yard, I seriously doubt that he said, now that is a precious promise promise. Now I, say, I think it's more, much more likely that he would say, I'll believe it when I see it. <laughs> Promises from politicians have, be, have become something that we all know will almost never come true. Before an election, they'll promise the world, but as soon as they are in office, those promises seem to be forgotten. So we know that man's promises can and often will fail us. But one of the reasons that God's promises are so precious, one of the reasons that God's promises are so perfect is that they can never fail. God has always fulfilled every promise that He has ever made. And that should give us great encouragement, that should give us great joy, and that should give us great confidence in Him. God beginning the Old Testament has always been one to make promises. Look with me there in Genesis chapter 2 and beginning in verse 15. It says, The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but the tree of knowledge and good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. We understand that God's promises to Adam and Eve were as long as they didn't eat of the tree, the knowledge of good and evil, He would take care of them and He would bless them in the Garden of Eden. But He also promised that the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. And we know that the woman was tempted and the man thereafter, and they did eat. And we see the conclusion of their sin in chapter 3, verse 24. He drove out the man... In the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. God fulfills his promises. And you see that here in both blessing Adam and Eve while they were in the garden, and when they sinned, he threw them out of the Garden of Eden. God made a promise or a covenant with every creature of the earth. After the great flood, he said that he would never destroy the earth again. Very familiar story to all of us, of course. Noah, how Noah saved himself and his family by building the ark to God's exact specifications. After he destroyed the earth and all its inhabitants by water, he made this promise in Genesis chapter 9, verse 8. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, Behold, I establish my covenant with you and your offspring after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the livestock, and every beast of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark, it is for every beast of the earth. I establish my covenant with you, that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, This is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you. For all future generations I have set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh, and the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. When we see a rainbow in the clouds today, we see... A precious promise that God has made to all of us. 
And it should be a reminder to us all that God keeps his promises. God made three very precious and important promises to Abraham. He made Abraham and his descendants a land promise. He made them a nation promise. And he made them a spiritual promise that all the blessings of the earth, that all the people of the earth shall be blessed through him. Look with me, starting in Genesis, verses 12 and verse 1. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. These aren't just any promises. These are precious promises. These are promises that had great impact on the Lord's people. He is going to give them a land. He's going to make them a great nation. He's going to bless all the families of the earth. And we know that all of these things, all of these promises came true. A couple of lengthy readings to look at, beginning in Exodus 6, 2 through 8. Exodus chapter 6, 2 through 8. God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. But by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land in which they lived as sojourners. Moreover, I have heard the groaning of the people of Israel, and the Egyptians hold as slaves, and I have remembered my covenant. Say therefore to the people of Israel, I am the Lord. I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from slavery to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm with great acts of judgment." I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God, who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will bring you into the land that I swore to give to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob. I will give it to you for possession. I am the Lord. And then turn over to Joshua chapter 1. Joshua chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, Moses, my servant is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, into the land that I am giving to them, to the people of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you, just as I promised to Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, the great sea, toward the going down the sun shall be your territory. No man shall be able to say before you all the days of your life, just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give to them. So we can see from these two readings that he fulfilled his promise to give them the land. And we can also see that he fulfilled his promise to make them a great nation. In Genesis chapter 46 and verse 3, it says, I am God, the God of your father. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for there I will make you into a great nation. And in Exodus 1 and verse 7, But the people of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly. They multiplied and grew exceedingly strong so that the land was filled with them. God fulfilled His promise to make them a great nation. And finally, God fulfilled the most precious promise that He's ever made by saying that He would bless all the families of the earth. How did he do that? We know that from Scripture, he did that by sending his son, by sending Christ. Galatians chapter 3, verses 7 through 9. Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the Scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall the nations be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. Continuing on down in verse 13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Curses everyone who is hanged on a tree. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised Spirit through faith. To give a human example, brothers, even with a man made covenant, no one annuls it or adds to it once it has been ratified. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. 
It does not say into offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring who is Christ. That is what I mean. The law, which came 430 years afterward, does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God so as to make the promise void. God fulfilled this third promise when he sent his son to die on the cross for the sins of the world. Anybody who comes to him today, who believes in him, who has obedience in him, can share in that great blessing that God offers. And in doing so, you participate in the spiritual promise that God made to Abraham all those years ago. I'm going to look at one more promise this evening from the Old Testament, and then we will turn our attention over to the New Testament, the many wonderful promises that we have in Christ today that we can read there. But if you will, turn your Bibles over to the book of Jonah. Over to the book of, of Jonah. God makes a promise here that unless the city of Nineveh repents, He will destroy it. Look with me in Jonah chapter 3, in beginning in verse 3. It says there, So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days' journey in breadth. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey, and he called out, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be, ever, shall be overthrown. And we know that the prophet Jonah, he had been chosen by God to take this message to Nineveh. And of course, we know that he ran from God, that he was swallowed by a great fish, and that he himself had to do some repenting. But once he repented, and once he decided that he was going to do what God wanted him to do, he took the prophecy to Nineveh, and that prophecy was that the evil that was in the city had come up before God, and that he was going to destroy it in 40 days. Continue with me there in verse 5. The people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least. The word reached the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he issued a proclamation and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth, and let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hand. Who knows, God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he said he would do to them, and he did not do it. God's promise was that he was going to destroy the city unless they repented. The people here took heed of that message that Jonah brought. They repented of their wickedness, and they saved themselves from that destruction in the process. I want to hope that we all see from these examples of God's promises in the Old Testament is that first and foremost, what God says is going to happen. His word is truth. He keeps his promises. If he says it, it will happen. But also I want you to see, as we start looking at these promises that are in the New Testament, these promises that we have in Christ, I hope you'll see that we can look back at these examples in the Old Testament, and we see that they were only a blessing to people who were obedient to him. And these examples in the Old Testament really set the groundwork for that. Adam and Eve were blessed as long as they were obedient. Once they were not, those blessings were taken away. The children of Israel were blessed with the promises that God made to Abraham about their land and their nation as long as they were obedient. As soon as they turned from God, He took those blessings away. Even the people of Nineveh were not spared their lives until they repented and they turned to God. Joshua, Joshua sums it up best in chapter 23 and verse 15 when he says this, but just as all the good things that the Lord your God promised concerning you have been fulfilled for you, so the Lord will bring upon you all the evil things until He has destroyed you from off this good land that the Lord your God has given you. If you transgress the covenant of the Lord your God, which He commanded you, and go and serve other gods and bow down to Him, then the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you, and you shall perish quickly off the good land that He has given you. What's he saying here? He's saying that God has fulfilled all of the promises that He made to you, every one. But if you transgress the covenant, they will be taken away. 
And of course, we know that this happened. There are just so many wonderful blessings and promises to have through Christ Jesus, but they're only for those who put him on in obedience. If you remember, our text for the lesson this evening is 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 4, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises. And we've looked at some of these wonderful and precious promises that God made in the Old Testament. And now I want to turn our attention to promises that God has made in the New Testament and some of the ones that affect their blessing to our lives. And the first one is that God promises to hear our prayers. God promises to hear our prayers. We know the first Thessalonians 5 and verse 17 says to pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing, but do we always know that God is listening? Is He listening to every prayer? Matthew chapter 6 and verse 6. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. In Matthew chapter 7, on down in verse 7, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks it will be opened. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to good, give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, give good things to those who ask him? And in John 15 and verse 7, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. We have another example of this in the parable of the persistent widow that is found in Luke chapter 18. You'll read there with me, Luke chapter 18, beginning in verse 1. He told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. He said, in a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, Give me justice against my adversary. For a while he refused, but afterward he said to himself, Though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice, so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. And the Lord said, Hear what the unrighteous judge says. And will not God give justice to his elect, who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? Over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? God promises through his word that he will answer our prayer. And just in case that doesn't convince you, we have one more example I want to look at about answering prayer found in Exodus chapter 32. Exodus chapter 32, beginning in verse 7. And the Lord said to Moses, Go down. For your people whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way that I commanded them. They have made for themselves a golden calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore let me alone, that my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them in order that I may make a great nation of you. But Moses implored the Lord his God and said, O Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say with evil intent did he bring them out to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your burning anger. Relent from this disaster against your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by your own self and said to them, I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven. And all this land that I promise I will give to your offspring, and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord relented from the disaster that he had spoken of bringing on his people. Moses' prayer was certainly heard here. God changed his mind because of Moses' prayer, because of the prayer that Moses prayed. God hears our prayers. We can be assured of that precious promise. Another precious promise that we have is that he promises to take care of our needs. He promises to take care of our needs. Matthew chapter 6, verse 25. Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, 
or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. What a blessing. What a blessing it is to know that God knows what we need. That's what it says right there in verse 32. It says, Your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. He knows our needs. And he's telling us not to worry about those things because he will take care of them. He takes care of the birds. He takes care of the lilies. And he will take care of us. Look also with me, if you would, in Philippians chapter 4, beginning in verse 10. Philippians chapter 4, beginning in verse 10. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly. But now at length you have revived your concern for me. You are indeed concerned for me, but you have no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases your credit. I receive full payment and more. I am well supplied. And we receive from Aphrodite the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And my God will supply every need of yours according to the riches in glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Paul is telling the Philippians here that whether he was poor or whether he had plenty, he was always content and he always knew that God was taking care of his needs. And he finishes by instructing them and telling them that God will take care of their needs as well. God will take care of our needs. He's done it for his people in the past, and he will do it for us today if we remain faithful to him. The third promise that God has made is that he will provide a way to escape temptation. 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13. No temptation is overtaking you that is not common to man. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to. To endure it. We understand that Romans 3.23 says that all have sinned, all have fallen short. So temptation is something that we all face. It's all something that we have to endure. It's something that we all have to work at. But God promises us that if we will turn to Him, He will help us. He will assist us. Hebrews 2 and verse 18, For because He Himself has suffered when tempted, He is able to help those who are being tempted. And in chapter 4 and verse 15, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We know about the temptation of Jesus. He was tempted. And when he was tempted, he was subjected to every type of temptation there is. So what it says there in John chapter 2 and verse 16, it says that we learn all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but it is of the world. Jesus was tempted by every one of these, and he conquered every one of these. 
And he did it by using God's Word. In each response, in each instance, he said, it is written. When we read, when we become knowledgeable in God's Word, we are building one of the best defenses there is against temptation. The psalmist in Psalm 119 and verse 11 said it this way, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Jesus was tempted. He overcame that temptation. And he promises that he will help us, he will assist us with our temptation as well. A fourth promise that God makes to us is that his grace will be sufficient for us. His grace will be sufficient for us. 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 9 says, He said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Back in chapter 11, Paul recounts the many trials and the tribulations that he endured. And in chapter 12, he mentions his thorn in the flesh. And he tells the Corinthians that he prayed to God about this thorn in the, in the flesh. And of course, we know that God's response to that was, my grace is sufficient for you. We are all going to face hardships at some point in this life. We are all going to face difficult times. And it may very well be that when we face those hardships, that they will never be resolved in the way that we are hoping that they will be resolved, in the way that we want them to be resolved. Paul is telling us here that whether they are resolved, whether they're not resolved, we need to find strength and we need to find contentment in the Lord. And why is that? For the sake of Christ. For the sake of Christ, so that our work for the Lord will not be hindered by the things that we are struggling with. Precious promise that His grace is sufficient for us. The fifth promise that we have from God is that sin doesn't have to control us. Sin does not have to control us. Romans 6 and verse 14, For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. We, we no longer live under the old law. We live under the new law, the new covenant of grace. Christ has died on the cross for our sins. Therefore, this sin does not have to have dominion over us. John 16 and verse 33, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Christ has overcome the world. He has overcome sin. Therefore, this sin does not have to reign in us. It does not have to have control over our lives. That's a precious promise that has been given to us. The sixth promise is that God promises a forgiveness of sins. 1 John 1 and verse 9, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and He is just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Sin, sin is a big problem. It is a huge issue because it separates us from God. Isaiah in chapter 59 puts it this way, But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God. And your sins have hidden His face from you so that He does not hear. First John 1 and verse 8 says, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. We've all sinned. We have all fallen short. And that separates us through, from God. But through Christ, through His sacrifice on the cross, if we will confess those sins... And as other verses teach, if we will repent of those sins, we will be obedient to Him. We will have forgiveness of those sins. And that leads us to the seventh and final precious promise that I want to look at this evening. And that is that God promises us eternal life. He promises us eternal life. Romans 6 and verse 23, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Verse John 2 and 25, and this is the promise that he has made to us, eternal life. And in John chapter 10, verses 27 and 28, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. 
I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. To those who are faithful to him, God promises eternal life. He promises a life in heaven with him for all eternity. What an amazing and precious promise that is. I think it is important to take just a moment this evening and to think about and to remember why God is able to make these promises. Why can God stand before us and make these promises? 2 Peter 1 and verse 3, His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us to His own glory and excellence. Ephesians 3, beginning verse 20, Now to Him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to Him be the glory in the church, and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. God's divine power gives Him the ability to make and to fulfill all the promises that He has made to us. That is an amazing thing. You remember our reading this evening is from 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 4. It says there, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises. And Peter continues on with that statement. So that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature. That word there, partakers, literally means that we become sharers or we become partners. And it points to the relationship that we as Christians enjoy in the Lord. By believing in these great and precious promises that we've looked at this evening, and by being obedient to His will, we become true sharers. We become true partners in His holy divine character, which God possesses. The question for you this evening is, are you a partaker of God's exceedingly great and precious promises? Are you being obedient so that one day you can live in heaven with Him? If not, you can do that this very evening. We would hope and we would pray that you would. You become a Christian, you hear the Word of God. You believe Him. Repent of your sins. Confess that Jesus is the Son of God because He assuredly is. Be baptized for the remission of sins and live a faithful life unto death. We can help you in any way. Would you come now? Together we stand as we sing.